Hi, Noshers. My name is Micah, the host of Not Your Bubby's Nosh, a conversation about your favorite and least favorite Jewish foods, your go-to source for holiday meal inspiration and a place to discuss and kvetch about which Bubby made it best. Today, I'm talking about all of my favorite Jewish food moments in movies and TV. Now, I'm no movie buff, I'm not a TV junkie, but I do love a good food episode or moment in TV, and it's typically a positive way to talk about Judaism and bring a little Jewish joy onto the screen. And as a Jewish person growing up watching Hollywood movies, anytime you'd see something you can relate to, it was exciting, right? Like otherwise it's a lot of Christmas movies. It's a lot of Hallmark movies, but the second there's a Jewish one that comes out, I'm all for it. Um, on that note, there was like a Hanukkah book that came out last year called The Matzah Ball, I think, that is just like ripe to be made, a made for TV movie by Hallmark or Netflix or something where it's so cheesy about a love story about a Hanukkah party. And I hope that happens. So I'm putting that into the world. So I hope that next holiday season, it exists. So let's dive into it and talk about one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, I don't even know if it's a tr- full on food scene, but I feel like you can't talk about this subject without bringing it up. And that's Dirty Dancing. What a fantastic film, a piece of cinematic history, truthfully. And the one moment that I think about, because there's not that many food moments in this movie, but the one that I think about is when Jennifer Grey is just holding that massive watermelon at the party. And that just brought me back to summer camp and some Jewish summer camp. That was a staple that always drew a crowd when it was snack time and it was a watermelon slice. It was like they were feeding you something from the heavens. Um, I also feel like Dirty Dancing gave me a lot of false hope in terms of what summer camp was going to look like for me. I definitely did not um, dance with someone that looked like Patrick Swayze. It was not fancy. It was definitely a little bit more rodent infested. Um, Like there was very little dancing besides our um, like weekly dances in one of the camp buildings and it was definitely nothing fancy. There was no showcase. I guess there was a showcase at the end, but definitely I did never, I never had my Jennifer Grey moment, but I just really love that scene where she's holding that huge watermelon and walks into the party. So the other ones are a little bit more Jewish food related. I just love Dirty Dancing because who doesn't? I feel like it's a classic piece of Americana. But the next one is another one of my favorite movies, and that is When Harry Met Sally. You cannot talk about Jewish food in movies without talking about this rom-com. It's from 1989, and there's a specific scene that was at the New York Katz's Deli. Um, Harry orders a number three pastrami sandwich, and Sally has a really difficult order. She orders a chef salad with oil and vinegar on the side and an apple pie a la mode. Heated pie, ice cream on the side, but strawberry ice cream, not vanilla. If there's no strawberry ice cream, she just wants whipped cream, but only if it's real and not from a can. And if it is from a can, then she just wants the pie, but cold. And the waitress is so unimpressed with her. Um, and they then have a conversation about um, women faking orgasms in the deli. And Sally goes on to vocally fake one and it prompts an older woman to say, I'll have what she's having. And I feel like that's such an iconic line. There's even a museum exhibit that's been touring around that's called I'll Have What She's Having and it's a look at Jewish food. I've been wanting to go see it. Um, It just hasn't, the stars haven't aligned for me to take time off work, but this long-winded order of Sally's becomes a really big theme in the movie. Spoiler alert, it finally becomes something that Harry just finds adorably irresistible about her when they find out that they love each other. And it is just such a fun scene. I really feel like I can relate to it because I am that long-winded order. I know exactly what I like. I like it a certain way. I see you, Sally. I am you. And I can absolutely order the exact same way um, when I go out to eat. Maybe that's just because I'm spoiled at home because I 
make food for a living, but what a great moment in a movie. Like I absolutely love that. And for another movie slash series based in New York that has a surprising amount of Judaism kind of trickled and sprinkled within it is actually Sex in the City. For those of you who don't know about Sex in the City, it's about, I think, four female friends living in New York and trying to find relationships and navigating all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And how does Carrie afford that gorgeous apartment on a writer's salary? I will never know. And they have one friend named Charlotte. And Charlotte meets Harry Goldenblatt, who she falls in love with. And Harry is a Jewish man and she wants to be the ultimate nice Jewish girl for her nice Jewish boy. So she finally converts to Judaism. And that was kind of exciting to see on Sex and the City, this um, interfaith marriage, the conversion process, her really embracing this new identity and forming a family based on Jewish values. I think that that was a really cool Jewish moment to have on such a huge TV show. So after meeting Harry um, in season six, she wanted to really become that perfect girlfriend and was kind of trying to guilt him into proposing. So she makes a whole spread of his favorite foods, like all these Ashkenazi dishes. I think there's brisket, matzo balls. I'm pretty sure there's challah. She puts like... She puts on Shabbat candles and it's a, it's a whole ordeal. And obviously, because it's a dramatized TV show, it ends in a huge Sex in the City style fight where she doesn't know if they're going to stay together or whatever. But one of her lines is, I had to make 30 matzo balls just to get four that were the right size and shape. In that line, I'm like, when I hear that, I'm like, if you ask me, it's not the size and the shape of a matzo ball that matters. It is distinctly if they're sinkers or floaters. So maybe hers were sinkers and Harry was like, there's no way I can, I can marry a woman who can't make floaty matzo balls. I don't know, but 30 matzo balls is a lot. And obviously Charlotte doesn't know that they're best eaten the next day, that I love them cold in a bowl in my hand on a plate any way you give them to me. So I feel like 30 matzo balls is a good problem to have, truthfully. To get into something a little bit more serious and high quality in terms of television, just kidding, it's it's the OC. I'm a 90s kid through and through and I grew up watching the OC. It was like a big night when the OC came on. I loved that Seth Cohen existed. Like what a nice Jewish boy. We could watch him navigate his charmed life um, in Southern California with this kind of socialite status of just being ridiculously wealthy. But I also loved the small Jewish references and nods like the Santa hat kippot, the chrismaka, and just some of the little things that he would say and do with his family. It like totally made me feel a little seen even though I was not living a term life up in Canada and couldn't be further from his truth, but that's okay. And there's one scene that it's a Sunday morning and I guess Sunday mornings are reserved for bagels in the Cone household of Orange County, California. And I think it's like Marissa is going through yet another crisis. Like does her dad leave? Does her mom sleep with her boyfriend? Like, is it what we don't know at this point what it is? I can't remember. There's too many crises for me to count with that one. But she gets to the Cohen household and she brings a bag of bagels. And Sandy Cohen, Seth's dad, the ultimate Jewish dad of television, is elated. You know, he brings them in, he welcomes her in and he shows her how to smear them. He even brings out one of those bagel guillotines that like all of our families have, but nobody knows where we bought it. And it's like a beautiful thing. And somebody says like, are you all right? Um, And she says, yes, we have bagels. And yes, we do have bagels and bagels do make everything all right. So I feel like that was kind of a fun, a fun scene, especially for just the parallels of how bagels make things better, food makes things better. And in Judaism, just food is such a, an emotional journey to go on. It's not just you're eating for sustenance, like you're totally eating for comfort and for love and all of all of these emotions that food can totally bring out. And bagels honestly do make some things better. The next one is a newer series. I mean, now that nobody has cable and everyone's streaming everything, you can watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon. And there's some controversy about 
Mrs. Maisel, the fact that she's not played by a Jewish actress. But regardless, to see, again, another part of Judaism on screen and breaking out Jewish joy and a strong female lead, that's something I'll always applaud. And I really think that Mrs. Maisel or Midge Maisel, Miriam Maisel, is the female Jewish superhero that we didn't know we needed. I, I absolutely love her. So early in the first season, it could have even been the first episode, Mrs. Maisel or Midge runs into a butcher and says that they've secured the rabbi for the Yom Kippur fast. And she's so excited. She skips the entire line. It's this huge deal. And she orders a lamb because the rabbi loves lamb. And the woman behind her is frustrated because she just got in line. So she even pays for her food. And on the way out, she grabs a couple of black and whites, one of which she gives to her doorman. And they start to prepare the Yom Kippur feast, um, which I love. In another episode, she brings her friend Imogene, one of her non-Jewish friends, she, Mrs. Maisel's in red, Imogene's in green, and they're in this old deli, her favorite deli, and Imogene doesn't know what to order. So Midge says, you know what? I got this. I got you. And she orders a feast of a hot pastrami Reuben on rye, chicken in a pot, potato knish, matzo ball soup, a cheese danish, and a black and white cookie. Oh, and a bromo seltzer. The cheese danish is kind of the rogue one. I don't know where that came from. I don't really see that as a Jewish jelly food, but you know, that's okay. We can't win them all. But of course, the bromo seltzer hits home because of all of the digestive issues that you would A, get from all of that food, that heavy food, but also B, just from being a Jew. And finally, in another episode, Midge's or Mrs. Maisel's mother-in-law is over and she shares that she had put her own chicken soup in the freezer the last time she was visiting. She then asks Midge's mom if she has mats meal and says, oh, don't worry, I've got some in my purse. Uh, because don't we all have a little bit of mats meal in our purse? And like, I totally feel like that's the quintessential stereotypical Jewish mother-in-law or just mother-in-law thing like, oh, your chicken soup's not good enough. Your mom's chicken soup isn't good enough. Let me make my own chicken soup, bring it over, think about this in advance, put it in the freezer so that next time I'm at your house, I can have a decent meal. I absolutely love that. And I think it's so cute that that happened. And I also just like love that she has matzo meal in her purse. Like, is that a seasonal thing? Is that an all the time thing? Like, why do you have matzo meal in your purse? I could see having, I don't know, like, I feel like I could probably stand to put some like seasonings in my purse for someone else's chicken soup or even... um put like a little nosh, like a little halva in there. But matzo meal is like a very suspect thing. I don't typically walk around with a baggie of powder in my purse because it looks really sus. It looks really suspect. So I think that that's such a fun scene. And I'm saving the best for last because you cannot talk about Jewish food in media and television without talking about Seinfeld. Seinfeld is the... I think the best show ever created. It's something I watch frequently. I watch it in the background. I watch it while I'm traveling, flying, can't sleep, bored, lonely. Seinfeld is really just, this is just my love letter to Seinfeld at this point, but it is full of first of all, really relevant jokes. Like these jokes are still funny. And it's also full of a ton of food references. Not all of them are Jewish. Many of them are not. Like those Mackinac peaches or when George eats that eclair out of the garbage can. There's so many, like doesn't Kramer work at h, h Bagels at some point? I guess that's Jewish-ish. But there are so many food references. Oh my goodness, the non-fat yogurt scandal. Like when they were all going to this non-fat frozen yogurt place, then they were all gaining a ton of weight because they had to discover, was it actually non-fat? Like, is it actually healthy? There was that whole thing about it. And that was before Froyo became like the hot thing in North America, or as far as I'm concerned. Or what about when Seinfeld's trying to avoid dinner with Banya and they go to things like Mendy's and he orders just soup, but that's not dinner. So he's still owed dinner by Seinfeld. Um, or their daily encounters at the deli or diner for their cup of coffee. 
Seinfeld and food go together like bagels and schmear, honestly. It's so ingrained in that TV show that you can't think about Seinfeld without having a reference to one of those episodes. So I'm going to go through a couple of my, just two of um, my favorite episodes that have to do with Jewish food. One of them is in season five and that's the dinner party. So Jerry and Elaine are at a local bakery to grab a dessert for a dinner party. And while they're looking around, Jerry chooses one of New York's finest black and white cookies. And he gives his little spiel about why he loves them, which is, I love the black and white, two races of flavor living side by side. And he just loves his black and white cookies. And I mean, I also love a black and white cookie. And I mean, I think he got sick later in that episode, which like broke some longstanding no vomit that he hadn't vomited in a long time. I don't know. But just that point of like grabbing the black and white cookie off the shelf. And then when he goes to pay for it, he makes some sort of nod about like, oh, he's so welcoming. Or he, I think he gives a peace sign. And I think it's just like such a cute moment. But in that same episode, um, they're looking for babka to take for dessert, a chocolate babka, I presume. And then someone takes the last one and they are like heartbroken. Like they are unwell that their babka does not exist. So they're like going around the bakery looking for a different dessert. They ask like, what about carrot cake? And Jerry makes a joke about why do they have to put carrots in dessert? Or a Napoleon, like why would they want to have a Napoleon? He was a terrible fighter and man. And why don't they just get a Mengele? Um, and then they are offered a cinnamon babka and they gasp oh, another babka as if like they didn't know it existed. So like, how cute is that? I personally love a cinnamon babka. Like I think it's the best babka for French toast or for the next morning, like put a little dab of peanut butter on there and it is like, oh, perfection. So that's like, what a cute little interaction at this Jewish bakery or bakery in New York bakery, where they can look at and find all of these Jewish foods. I absolutely love that. And then the last episode that I had in mind that really brings Jewish food to the forefront is in season seven, and it's called The Rye. So there is this mar famed marble rye in New York, I guess, that like people take buses for and people wait in line for and it sells out. And so when George and his parents are going to visit his fiance's family for the first time, that's what his parents want to take. And so they bring this rye to the house and her parents totally forget to put it out. They don't even think about it. It's kind of a weird hostess gift. Like, do you imagine if you were hosting a dinner and someone's like, here, take this rye bread? They're also kind of like freaked out that she didn't serve cake, I believe. So it was like this really weird interaction. So the host didn't serve it. End of story. And so they're driving back and it's George's parents and himself in the car and they're complaining about the parents and they're agreeing that it they were not the best hosts and they felt like idiots because they didn't have coffee with their cake or cake with their coffee. I can't, I can't recall. But the biggest thing is, is that they find the loaf of bread in the car and they say, oh my goodness, did we forget to bring it in? And his dad says, no, I took it back. Like, of course I took it back. He says, what? And George says, like, so you stole it. And his dad says, what do you mean stole? It's my bread. They didn't eat it. Why should I leave it there? And like, I absolutely love that because they're right. Like, are they right? I don't know if they're right. I feel like if my host didn't put out what I, what I gave them, I wouldn't necessarily be offended, but I feel like perhaps they're going to eat it the next day for sandwiches. But like, I love that they were so passionate about this marble ride that they went to go seek it out to bring it to this family. And then they were so heartbroken when they weren't served it that they just flat out took it away. They took the gift away. Could you imagine? I think that that's, I just love that. So definitely go rewatch some of these episodes and find your own joy in these food scenes. Cause there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of gems in between Seinfeld and Mrs. Maisel, especially. I feel like every episode has something hidden in there. And this is just more mainstream TV shows. Like we didn't even talk about Stissel on Netflix, which follows the ultra Orthodox family in, I believe, Jerusalem. And we didn't talk about some of these other tiny little food scenes, like when they talk about, 
I don't know, like fasting for Yom Kippur on Arthur, or we didn't talk about the like rugrats. Like what about all those rugrats food scenes for all of my other 90s uh, babies or people with children who, or adults like myself who watch those episodes every holiday season. So there you have it. Some of my favorite Jewish food moments on television and on screen. If you have a different favorite, let me know. Email me at micah at noshwithmicah.com or slide into my DMs at noshwithmicah on Instagram. Not Your Bubby's Nosh is a part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network and is produced by Jew Folk Inc. For more shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. If you've got questions, email me at micah at noshwithmicah.com.